So I would be starting with the uh, tracker capture web session today and uh, I'll just share my screen and then continue. Okay, hope my screen is visible to everyone. Uh, so once you log into your Moodle accounts, you will be able to see the session today for Tracker Capture Web and the related documents. So I'll be giving you a brief introduction to Tracker Capture followed by a demonstration. During the demonstration, I will stop after a few steps and you could practice what will be demonstrated during the session. Uh, for your practice, there are four exercises that have been designed, which can be found at the learner's guide uh, link here. Uh, whenever we need to practice an exercise, I will let you know and you could open this document to find the related exercise. After the session, then there is a graded assignment, which you could do after the today's session finishes. At your own convenient time, you could submit that graded assignment later. So to start with, uh, let's see what are our learning objectives from this session. So from this session, we'll understand how do we select the correct program, uh, what is the layout and the different options which are available in the Tracker Capture app. Uh, after understanding those layouts, we'll start with registering the case and see how can you register a case and fill in the event or the program stage details for the case. Uh, then I'll show you how to search for a track identity instance in case you've already added a person. How could you search? Then I'll show you how we can add relationships within Tracker Capture. And uh, lastly, how we have built in skip logics, how they can be added in the, they can be used in the Tracker program through, uh, through the data entry page. So, uh, I'll start with the demonstration and we'll come back again to the presentation to see did we achieve all of these during my demo. So I'll be using the demo instance and uh, all of you have been shared the exercise instance link. So whenever we stop for practicing, you could use the exercise instance link and your logins have been created. You could use your logins and perform these steps. Uh, I would suggest that while I'm giving the demonstration, maybe you could look at the demo first and then we'll be giving you like 10 minutes after each demo to practice that. So it'll be good if you look at the screens now and you can practice later on where we'll support you in case you get stuck somewhere. Kindly use Slack channel for all your queries during the session if you think uh, I have to slow down or you want to repeat something, you could kindly let us know there and our team will accordingly coordinate. So on the um, demo instance, we have uh, COVID-19 vaccine registries and COVID-19 case-based surveillance programs available, which we will be using for the demonstration. This is a pilot uh, setup which was done for Laos, so we are using the same for our demo. And I'm going to track a capture to show you those uh, programs. So basically these programs are used for tracking the suspected case for COVID-19, uh, registering their symptoms, demographic details, if there are any identified risk factors, and raising the lab requests for them. All of these programs are assigned at the clinic. So as you see on my tracker capture homepage, on the left side, I see Laos. I need to select a facility where the program is assigned. Currently, there is nothing assigned to Laos, which is the country level. So I'll click on this plus sign next to Laos. 
and further down i will select this uh, chw mahosa community health worker so i'll select this facility or the organization unit as we call it in dhis2 and then i can see all the programs which are assigned to this facility so for the current demo i'm focusing on the vaccine registry program and this is my home page for the tracker capture so as you see here we see these line list of cases and these tabs so these are working lists which are defined using apis and they are uh, automatically shown here so clients with a scheduled visit show us the cases who are supposed to visit today or who came today i mean all of them who have event dates or scheduled dates for today clients with an overdue vaccine dose are patients for whom the vax patients or persons for whom the vaccines were scheduled but they did not come so if there are overdue completed events are for the clients where all the events have been completed all the vaccines have been given and all clients is where we can see all the different cases who are registered into this program so this shows all the cases here now you see in the line list we have national id first name surname and sex so these are the four options which we have configured here you can add more columns here i'll just show you that so here you see these three options the first one is to download so you can download this line list this filtered line list as xml json or csv another option is to print you could print out this line list if you want to keep a hard copy and then you see this table structure this is for the columns so if you select this this is to show high columns now we have the attributes where we register the patient like name surname id address phone number while we create attributes we we check an option for displaying them in the line list in the form here so the attributes where we have said show in form all of them will be available here and out of this list i can say okay i want to see their date of birth also or i want to see their registration unit and i could save so now my line list also includes these additional attributes in the list i could filter out from here so if i want to filter based on maybe names uh, alphabetically or i want to see male female so whatever sorting i want to do i can do the sorting from these arrows that you see next to the attribute heading now you have additional options for filtering which are available in the custom working list so if i select custom working list you can say i want to see the patients the clients for selected organization unit which is selected or the ones below my level so this is just the lowest level so the selected here shows all the cases at the facility i can filter out for the cases with enrollment status as completed or active or cancelled as well i could filter based on date of registration user assignment so if we are assigning any users to the stages we can also filter based on that i could also filter based on a particular id names date of birth so all these are additional option for filtering out the cases now if i switch to some other program where we do not have these working lists say if i go to case based surveillance then you see these options which are available in the default tracker capture these are also options to filter out your search here so like the first option shows all the people or the person who are registered at the facility the second option here shows all the active enrollments which exist so it will show you uh, it will not show you the ones which have completed or deactivated or removed so it will only show you the cases with active enrollments into the program 
if you have completed the program for some cases then it will this tick option will show you the list of cases with completed enrollments and this cross option will show you the list of the cases with cancelled enrollments so from here again you could filter out your line list the default way as you want moving back to the vaccine registry program we also have the options here for search and register so list is where i'm seeing all these lists if i go to search based on my attributes i could search the uh, patients the clients from the nine list And then if I go to register, from register, I could add a new tracked entity instance. Yeah, so before moving on, I'll just summarize again. So on my tracker capture homepage, I have these working lists, options to filter down the list of cases. I have options to download, print, or I add or remove columns. I can drill down to the particular facility from the left hand side. If the user is assigned a particular facility, they will just see their facility into the list. From this tab, I can select the program which I want to see. And uh, we have these additional filters available here in the custom working list. Now, once we start registering a case, if the information that I'm entering here in the form it already exists for example a particular name or a particular date of birth whatever we select is uh, searchable if that already exists the system shows an alert that is it a duplicate can you please check just to let you know that uh, maybe you are doing a duplicate entry to the system so let me just start with the case which is already existing into the system and see how the system will show an alert. So once I click on register, I see my facility that I selected. Date of registration is by default today's date. Maybe I change it to like 1st of September. I can add the latitude, longitudes, national ID. Then there is this unique system identifier. So in this system, we've set up a key like EPI underscore this random number to be generated for each patient, which will be unique and auto generated from the system. You could yourself define these uh, identifiers. Uh, what is the format that you want? If you want to pick up date from any of the attribute fields, any other field, so you can accordingly create your own key for system identifiers and use them for your program. Now, suppose there is a case with the name Sharon already existing in the system. So I'm trying to add the same case here. Let me just add this name Sharon and try to save this record. So then the system will show me that there are already existing or cases with the same name so do you want to check if it is a duplicate so review possible duplicates now if my case is already there i can just select that case and in case my my person is not there then i can register a new person here right so if the case is already there i'll open that and enter the details but if it is a new case, I can still from the list say register a new person and it will add the case with the new details. Before coming here, I'll just add one more person and show you the registration form. So when I click on register, and these are the attributes that I need to fill. I'll try to give some other name now. Say test. I'll give some date of birth.
1st September and phone number, address, area, rural, urban, occupation. We can set in what fields are mandatory and just fill those. Now I have option of save and continue, save and add new or print form. So here, if I have to add multiple cases together, like I'm doing multiple registrations, I can keep on clicking on save and add new and adding all the patients first. Alternatively, I can go save and continue and start entering the event details for this program. So once I say save and continue, now there is again a case with a similar name. So the system will say that if it is duplicate, I could review. I could say that okay this is my case or i can say register new person so in register new person it will automatically take all these fields which i had filled right now into the form and register the case so this is now the patient dashboard for this particular dashboard now before moving further it will be good if you could first practice the registration page look at these options that i had shown you and uh, then we can move to this dashboard page so i will suggest you to open your moodle accounts and if you go to this learner's guide it will give you steps to do the exercise which is like a hands-on practice session so you can go to the exercise one which is to review the tracker capture interface. It shows you all these which I've shown right now for the demo. Use the exercise instance. You could try these activities and then we could start with the dashboard. So maybe we could have like 10 minutes for all of you to practice these steps before we move on. Okay, so since there is a request to repeat what you need to do, so on your Moodle page, when you go to today's session on Travel Capture Web, there is the link for Learner's Guide. In the learner's guide, there is exercise one, which gives you the steps, like you have to open tracker capture and you have to explore these things. So you could try out those steps and if there are any queries or questions, you can post them on Slack. So we'll have five, seven minutes more to practice these steps and then we'll move ahead. Okay, so if anyone is facing any issues, maybe or they want to ask anything, maybe they could raise their hands.
okay so some of you are not able to find the link to the learner's guide i'll show that again so on your moodle page when you go to this session so this is your tracker use level 1 academy here you have different sessions when you go to this tracker capture web session in the tracker capture web session you have tracker capture learners guide you have to click on this link it will open the learners guide wherein you have this exercise 1 i just move ahead in the interest of time so basically this was showing all the options which are available on the tracker capture home page and how could you register a new case now we'll move to the patient dashboard or what happens after you register the patient so yeah we'll move to reviewing the tracker dashboard So this is called the patient dashboard, tracked entity dashboard, person dashboard. As you see, here you perform the data entry for the different events or the visits of the person. So on this page, on the top you see what is called the top bar. It is a static top bar wherein you could define what all do you want to see on the top bar. so whenever you move around on this page this top bar remains static so that you could have the significant information which you require like if you have any information on allergies or if you need age to calculate something or any of the important information identifiers of the person they can be added to the top bar here there is a back button to go back to the tracker capture home page there are these arrows to scroll in between the different tracked entity instances or persons or patients then you have this enrollment widget so all of these are called widgets like this is one widget this is another widget so all of these are widgets so here you have enrollment widget wherein it will show you what is the facility that you have selected and what is the date of registration that you have selected you have the options to complete so if you want to complete the enrollment after all the visits are done that can be done you can deactivate the case from here if if the patient is no longer coming or for any reasons you want to deactivate you can mark this case for follow up if there is any risk involved or you want to come back to this case you can mark this for follow up from here we could define who gets access to deleting the enrollment so from this option you could also delete the enrollment for this person if the same person is enrolled to other programs those programs will also be available in this other program section of the enrollment widget then you have this feedback widget in the feedback widget you could add using program rules you could add different uh, factors different indicators for the patient that you want to see for example if there are any risk factors involved you want to see them on this widget if there is any results for any blood test you want to show them here so then you can use it here which is like easy reference for the person entering the data so this those can be added like weight of the person or any critical thing diagnosed you can add them here then you have indicators so when we create program indicators for example for a for a person you could have his weight height bmi his risk score for any particular disease his um, findings any of the indicators that you define can be added in this indicator widget which again help you during the assessment of the patient for easy reference for the cases 
this profile widget profile widget shows you the attributes which we had seen right now for the person so these attributes which you have added while registering the patient all of these attributes are available here you can edit and make changes to the attributes as you want and then save it save it from here then you have this timeline data entry where you enter the data for the different visits i will come back to this later uh, on how to enter the data but let's look at all the different options which are available here so here we have this information i option that you see icon this is to see the legends so to see what is what is green mean green means that this event is scheduled but if it is scheduled and it is overdue for example this was for a back date and the patient did not come back then this event is overdue it will turn pink if you open any event it will turn to orange which is the open and if you complete this it will turn gray so this is the legend then you have this option to compare form so from here you can compare the different events for the same program stage so for example once i add two vaccination events here i could compare both of them from this option then we have audit history from here we could see the who has entered what information in the program stage we have this collapse button from which we could collapse this timeline data entry widget we have this cancel option from which we can close it you have these notes where you can add the notes for the specific event or the visit of the case then is this relationship widget from where you could add the relations or connect them to the different other tracked entity instances in the program so for example uh, this person needs to be linked to another tracked entity instance so if i click on this add option here i can say if maybe they are relatives uh, spouse or son i mean children and parent you can select those person person relationship and it's important in covid what we can do is we can map the ones who are at risk because we can say that he this person has been in contact with so all of the contacts for this case for a suspected covid-19 case can be mapped here so in that case you can say has been in contact with and from this page you can all select which is the case which you want to select so you can say that person is enrolled in any of these programs say the case is in vaccination registry program i could search for that case and i could say okay uh it is linked it was in contact with this case i can select and i could say so then the same person with has been in contact with will be available in the relationship widget you could clicking on this will take you the dashboard to the dashboard of this related case this test case you can then link it from here using the relationship widget if the person was not already enrolled you could also add a new person by the same option here which you could explore then these notes these are same as the notes that we saw here just that these notes are linked to the enrollment so these remain with the patient throughout the enrollment while these notes are specific to each visit or each event of the patient then we have the report so this gives you an overview of all the information which is filled into the forms above so all of them can be seen here in the report yeah so so to summarize on this dashboard we have a top bar we have the list of programs in this drop down we have the enrollment widget we have indicators feedback profile data entry page widget then relationships where we could add relations to the existing case notes and then report now coming back to these three uh, icons that you see here so this one this is used to pin or stick the right side widget so if i select this so what we'll do is while i'm 
scrolling these widgets you see they would not move if i unpin this then these will also move so basically you are not able to see profile or the feedback widgets if they are important to you so if you stick them here then they will always be visible even if you are on the bottom of the page you can still see the profile and the feedback widgets then there is this red icon which is to manage the person so from here you could either delete the person or deactivate the person the activate will still keep this person in the system but he'll not no longer be in the active enrollment or the scheduled patients list he'll be deactivated while if you delete then it will be completely deleted from this line list so these again are control you can give this access to the super users or admin users then we have the settings option from the settings you have these four things that can be done i'll discuss each of them one by one so first is show hide widgets so all of these widgets that we are seeing these are controlled from this show hide widgets if i select show hide widgets you have all of these widgets which are visible if i say i don't want to see the report i uncheck this and i save then my report widget will no longer be visible here so then you can con control what widgets you want to see uh whatever changes you do they remain on this page but once later you come back login then it will show you the previous layout which was there So now, if you want to save these changed layout as the default, so you can say that save this as my dashboard layout as default. So I can say save as dashboard layout as default. This option unlock layout for all users. So right now we've locked it, so all the users cannot edit any of the uh, layout here but if we say lay unlock then the users could modify the widget change the layout and then they could save their new layout as the dashboard for them so to to avoid any user making changes and once our changes are saved we can just save it and lock the layout for all the users so then this remains locked and this remains the default dashboard layout that we see now one more option here is top bar settings so this top bar that we see this can again be configured from here so if i go to top bar settings so first thing is activate top bar if this is not checked if i have not activated my top bar and i don't see the top bar here so whenever i need to add a top bar the first thing is to go to the top bar settings and activate the top bar now in this top bar you can configure what all you want to see in the top bar so it by default it shows you all the attributes which are available and it will also show you if you have created some program rules or program indicators to show here they will also be available and then you can also add them to the top bar so like you see these indicators these are all calculated based on the data entry and you can show them in your top bar right now i've selected like three attributes national id unique id and first name if i also want to see the sex i can add it and if you see this automatically sorts you see the sorting order 1 2 3 4 so this is the order in which i will be able to see my records here so if i save this so then i see national id unique id first name and sex if i want to see the first name at the beginning at the very beginning i could again go to top bar settings and sort it accordingly i could say this should come second this should come third and first should be the first name Save, then it automatically gets sorted. Yeah, so I'll again unlock and save this dashboard layout as default, and then lock it for all the users. Yeah, so this is all on the patient dashboard. The different icons, options that we have. 
I will quickly summarize these. So you have a top bar, you have a back button, you have a list of programs available here. You have this enrollment widget which shows you the list details of enrollment. You have feedback indicators, profile that show demographics, relationship that show you how to add new uh, a relative or a contact or a person person relationship notes for the enrollment you have this data entry which we'll come back to wherein you have these options of showing the legends comparing the forms seeing the audit history collapsing the widget or closing the widget you have option for notes here then you have these three icons here to pin or stick this right side widget, to delete or deactivate a person, and to control the widgets which are visible, the top bar settings, and the layout for the users. On this timeline data entry page, as you see, we have four options here. So I'll just quickly show you these four options here. This arrow is to scroll in between the events. So if you have multiple events here, you can use this arrow to move between the events. This plus icon is to add a new event or a new program stage for the program. Once I enter this, I can add a new one. This calendar option is to schedule so that you can schedule another event based on when you want the patient to person to come back. This referral option is if you want to refer the case to some other facility. We'll perform all these actions as well, but this one is just an introduction to what all of these mean. And before we move to the important part of how do we enter the data, how do we refer, how do we schedule the events, it will be good to just revise all of these icons that we have seen right now. So which brings us back to the learner's guide and we have this exercise two for reviewing the dashboard. So we will again give you 10 minutes to look at these steps yourselves on the exercise instance. Follow these steps, look at these options to revise what we've just discussed. And once you are done with these, then we'll go ahead with entering the data into the data entry or the events. Yeah, so we'll break for 10 minutes for you to practice exercise two from the learner's guide. So just to, to repeat, if someone missed it, we all have seen the different options on the tracker dashboard, track entity instance dashboard. Uh, we would like you to perform exercise two and follow the different steps which are mentioned in the exercise two. Okay, so for those of you who missed uh, in between, we are doing exercise two now, which is just to explore the different icons, the options available on the tra tracker dashboard screen. So you can refer to exercise two, follow those steps, and we'll resume in five more minutes. Okay, so we'll move ahead and 
we look at entering the data in the data entry widget here. So as you see, once I have come to this page, one of the event is automatically scheduled based on the registration date. So considering that the person once he visits the facility, he's come for his first dose of vaccine. So I need to select the date where when the vaccine was given. So if I'm giving the vaccine today, and after I select the date, this data entry form opens. So these are the different sections in the data entry form. Underlying conditions, pre-immunization questions, vaccine information. So there are skip logics being used in the system. So as to when I select any answer, automatically relevant questions, if required, will appear. For example, if the patient is pregnant or lactating, if I say no. Any underlying conditions, if I say no, then I can move ahead. If I say yes here, then it will ask me to specify what are the underlying conditions or if others. So, or these are controlled through program rules wherein whenever we say yes, only then these questions need to be made available. So for now, I would say no here. Then has the patient been infected with COVID-19 within the last 90 days? I can say yes. Then it will say that it's recommended to give vaccine only after 90 days. This is again through program rules that we can show warnings or help messages to the user. If I say no, then this message will go. And then I come to the vaccine information wherein I need to select the vaccine details. When was it given? And you would see some of this information will get auto filled after that. For example, when I hear say vaccine given is I have these options. This can be configured accordingly and if I say Moderna then automatically it will select the brand and manufacturer I don't need to enter that information I can select the batch number the vaccine expiry date which you see can allow us the future date then dose number so automatically it's saying that if it's Moderna, you need to give two doses and the next scheduled dose will be on 24th October, which is like four weeks after this, 28 days after my first dose. And here it, I could specify maybe the person has taken vaccine somewhere else and is coming for another dose. So I would just say it's the first dose and this information is right. Second dose is to be given on this day. I can give the details of the health workers and if any adverse events had been seen before. I could say no. Now after all this information is filled, I click on this complete. And once I complete, it will automatically set up the uh, next stage for like 28 days after this. So now because I've said I have pre-configured in my program that the second stage or the second event needs to be done after 28 days. It will say, okay, do you want to schedule it? If you want to change the date, maybe the person says I can't come on this date, you could change it. Otherwise, you could leave it as it is and save. So you would see this another event gets scheduled in the system. Just to give an example of a backlog, if we had this date before today's day, then it would show in overdue here and overdue list on my working list. So you could explore those options while practicing. You could set in you no know, previous dates, like three, four months back date, and then you could see the different legends and the line list, the working list. How do they change? Till the time you don't create this event, you have an option to reschedule the due date. Maybe you can, uh, the patient asks you to reschedule and you can do that. But once this event is created, then you cannot reschedule this. So 
I don't have option for a future date, of course. So I'm just selecting today's date. And you see similarly the same details need to be filled in again. I'll just try to modify the previous date. Yeah, so now you see it comes in the order of the event. So this was the first event which was completed. It has turned gray. And now this is the event which is open, which is for the today's date. So on your exercise instance, you could also try to use the compare option and see compare both the events. Uh, like on completing, we were asked to schedule an event. Otherwise, you could also schedule by using this calendar option. And then is this referral option. So referral is if the person came in for vaccine today at my place, but uh, next vaccine he wants to take at some other facility. So I could use the referral option and say for this event, I need to refer the person to some other facility. So I, I am at this facility and I can refer to meetup up facility so I can select the new facility and you will see I'm sorry if the screen is but it says one time referral or move permanently so you could say okay refer only one time for this particular visit and only this event will be scheduled for the new facility if you say move permanently, then the entire enrollment, the entire record is moved to the new facility. So whatever is reported remains visible, but then all the future events and everything will be now visible at the new facility. So for now, I will just do one time referral here. And when I go to this new facility, which is under the CH and I search for the case. I think this one. I can see that for my new facility, this event is being scheduled for 24th October. The previous events, I can only view them, but I cannot make any change because these belong to some other facility. But the event which is assigned to me that I could modify as required. Right, so this is one time referral where only event is referred. Coming back to the previous facility and just summarizing again what we have seen. So do you see this patient is now available in the scheduled visit because I have scheduled a selected date for today and one visit was scheduled for today. Yeah, so we've seen how do we enter the data for the event. Once after uh, submitting all the data, we can complete and schedule the next event. We could also schedule the event from this icon. We could add a new event from this. We could move in between the events from here. And we could refer the case from this. We see the event or the reporting date here. And we see the schedule date or due date for the person visit here. So we'll stop again now for exercise number three. So after this, we just have a short multiple enrollments to cover. So we'll just break for like 10 more minutes to give you time to practice exercise three. Wherein in the exercise three, you have to practice entering data by following these steps in your learner's guideline, learner's guide. You can follow these steps, try to enter data yourself, look at the different alerts, warnings, skip logics in the exercise instance. And let us know if you have any questions or any doubts while performing the same.
Yeah, the exercises are available on the Moodle. So if you go to Learner's Guide for today's session, you will be able to see this document which has all the exercises for today. So we will be giving you five more minutes to practice data entry and then we'll move to the last part of this session. Okay, so hope all of you have practiced entering data following exercise three. We'll move to the last part of the demonstration, which is if you have to enroll the same person to another program. For example, this person test case is registered in the vaccination registry as he came to get vaccine. Maybe sometime later or for another case, the same person needs to be enrolled to case-based surveillance. Maybe if he was diagnosed with COVID-19 or for the contact registrations for any case. So this, you need not enter all the demographics, all the registration details for the patient. You could just enroll the same patient to person to multiple programs. I'll show this from the line list. So for example, this test case, this person is a part of vaccine registry. If I open this case, from the drop down list of programs on the top, I can open case based surveillance. Once I open it will say that it's enrolled to vaccine registry in other programs and it will not show you anything here because there is no active enrollment but you want to enroll this person to case-based surveillance. So you can click on add new. You see that the attributes will automatically be pre-filled. If there are few additional attributes required for this program, for example, local case ID, then you can enter them yourself. And then you can enroll the person to this new program. So the same person now is being part of vaccine registry and case-based surveillance program. And in this program, you could also see there are some indicators. So this is how we see indicators on the indicator widget. Right. For any case, if you want to scroll between the programs, you could just go to the vaccine registry and to the details you could go to the case-based surveillance and enter the details so all of this information is in the enrollment widget now come considering the case uh, maybe a use case where all the households or all the person at a place are already need to be already registered in the system for example i do not have any program I don't want to enroll them to vaccine registry or COVID case. I just need to have a repository of all the cases which are available at my facility, which are under my target population. So how do I add them? Because here you were adding, registering all the cases for a particular program. So now in that case, if I select my facility, I can just cross this out that I don't want any program. So you see you had three programs, but you don't want to select any. So this is called no program registration that you are adding the case without any program. So you could you can either search also for cases without any program by using this search option and it will search for the attributes which are searchable or you could register a new case by clicking on register. Register a person. 
and then add the details. So no program. I'm just adding a case here without any program. His ID is this and date of birth is this. And I can keep on adding as many cases as I want in this. Yeah, you can keep on adding multiple cases. And now at my facility, I have this list of cases available without program. I'm just not showing the list here, but you can see them here. And later when you have to add those cases here, So uh, this was the case that I had added, which we could see on the line list also, which is not currently active. So here, when I searched with the same name, it says that this case exists at this facility with no program. If I open this case, and now this case has come to me for vaccine, so I can enroll this person now to vaccine registry. So basically, I need not select the program before I could have all the person in my area already registered into the system. And when vaccines need to be given to them, they could be registered to this vaccine registry program. You can select the program. You can also register if that's a COVID case. You can add to this program. And after you select this, you have to click on add new. Enter the details which are required for this program. and enroll. So now this person will be enrolled to the vaccination program. So that's all for the demonstration wherein we have covered tracker capture homepage design, different options on the dashboard, how to enter the data for the events and how to enroll the same person to multiple programs. I would now request you to take five minutes to uh, explore exercise 4 which is registering to another program and then I'll quickly summarize this session before we proceed to the next one. So on your Moodle learner's guide you can find exercise 4 there. Okay, so I think we we are short of time now. So uh, this was the last step. You could practice this exercise and you could post your queries on Slack if there are any. Just to summarize this session. So on your Moodle page, you will find this session summary. So whenever you want to quickly revise these steps, it will give you a brief screenshots and summary of what we had discussed in this session. You could post whenever you have any queries, you could keep posting them on the Slack. And just to recap from what we discussed, so after this session, now we know how we can use Tracker Capture for searching, registering, and enrolling tracked entities. Now we are able to capture data for each event that occurs within the program. And uh, we have seen how we have access to multiple widgets from which we can give feedback, display indicators, add relationships. We also know how to refer our tracked entity instance to other facilities, either one time or permanently. And uh, we also know how to enroll the same tracked entity into multiple programs. The exercise link will remain open, so whenever, if you were not able to practice, you could continue practice after the sessions. A graded assignment will also be made open after the session today, and we request you to complete that assignment later in your free time. And I think we'll break for 10 minutes, and after 10 minutes, we, which is Maybe we'll start at 2.15 India time. So which is like 13 minutes break. Yeah, so see you after 
12-13 minutes. Hello everyone. So I hope everyone is back from the break. So we can continue with the session. Uh, so the next session that we have on the agenda is uh, looking at the DHIS to Android application. Uh, in the same way, we had to look at the web application, mainly with the perspective of uh, entering data and managing patients across uh, programs. So uh, we'll use uh, the same pattern. We'll have a series of demonstrations and uh, you'll have the learners guide available on Moodle where you'll have different exercises to do. So we'll cover a portion of the mobile app and then give you five to seven minutes to uh, do the exercise on the Android uh, application. Um, so let's have a look at the objectives of this particular session and then we move ahead with the installation and uh, the further demo of the Android application. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the session that we are convening now is entering tracker data on an Android uh, device. So the learning objectives of this session are we will explain the DHIS to Android application, and we will uh, demonstrate how to install the Android app uh, on your Android devices. Uh, then once we have the app installed, app installed on your respective device, then you can log in into the device using the exercise credentials that you have. Um, we can also share with you the common username and password that you need to use for the Android application. So once you log in uh, into the Android application, for the first time installation and login, you would need an internet connection. But thereafter, you can also collect data in offline mode when your device is not connected to the internet. So you can collect data offline as well. Uh, within the Android application, we will be looking at the following functions. One is, of course, searching for tagged entities, then registering new tagged entity instances, uh, navigating a person's tagged entity dashboard, uh, entering event data within program stages, completing an enrollment, adding relationships, enrolling a tagged entity instance into multiple programs, and working with tracker data offline. So these are the key learning objectives that we have to uh, this respective session. Just to give a quick introduction to the Android application. So the DHIS2 Android Capture App mobile application, which is designed to function seamlessly with your DHIS2 interface. So basically it takes the metadata from a web instance. So the source of the forms and everything is a web uh, database. It just changes the interface to a mobile compatible interface where you can add data using a tablet or a mobile phone. So uh, the content of the system remains the same, just that the mode of entry changes to uh, Android application. So the Android app at present supports uh, all the three models which are there, which we had a look at the day one and also in the webinars. So we have the aggregate data model where we report the data through data sets. And then we have individual level data where we report the information through tracker and uh, event programs. So the app will function in both online and offline mode. Uh, that means that the data and the metadata are automatically synchronized whenever there's internet access. Uh, data synchronization basically is pushing your data which you're collecting through the mobile application to the web server or the database. Whereas when you talk about metadata synchronization, this is basically the forms and the content of the programs that are defined on the web instance first and a copy of the same is downloaded on the Android application. Uh, there are chances that during the implementation, you will make certain changes to the program, which may require addition of new fields, updating drop down menus, etc. So once these are done on the web instance, the app also does a metadata synchronization and all the updates that have been made to the metadata are also pulled from the web server so that the users can access the latest forms which are available on the web instance and are also available on the Android application. <clears throat> So let's have a look at the steps on how you can install the Android application on an Android device. 
So the basic requirement is to have an Android device and the minimum version support is Android 5, but we recommend using Android 7 and above, but the app is compatible to uh, as low as Android uh, OS 5.0 as well. So the app is hosted on the Google Play Store. So I'll just quickly change my screen and cast my device. Okay. So on your Android device, you need to go to the Google Play Store and you need to search for DHIS2 capture. So DHIS2 capture, C-A-P-T-U-R-E. Once you search for this, you'll get the DHIS2 capture app as a search result. And you'll see this logo, the DHIS2 logo, and you'll get the option to install. Since I already have the app installed in my device, I get the option open. But if you're installing it for the first time, instead of open, you'll see the install button available here. Okay. So once you click on the install button, the app will take similar procedures as it takes uh, as it is done for any other application uh, download from play store so it will uh, download the application and does the installation for you okay so let me click on open so once the installation is complete the app will become a part of your uh, app drawer and you will see the dhis2 application installed on your device so once you click on the DHIS2 application, you will see three fields, which is a server URL, the username and the password. Okay. So once you put these vital uh, parameters for logging in, uh, the app will start downloading the metadata and the data from the Android application, depending upon what level of organization units, what clinics are assigned to this respective user and what data is available on the web instance, which can be pulled onto the Android application. So uh, let's take a couple of minutes to install the application uh, in your devices. In case you face any issue in the installation process, please uh, ping us on uh, either Zoom chat or on Slack. We can help you out with that. So uh, let's take five minutes to quickly install the application so that we can uh, move ahead with the uh, login and uh, review of the application as well. So Rob, can I have a quick question? Hear me, guys. Can I have a quick question? Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Uh, so Rob, there, there is a there is a link HTTP, and if you go all the way to the right, something is disabled. If I'm not wrong, this is some barcode reader or something like that. Yeah. So this is a QR code. In case uh, your server URLs are embedded in a QR code, then once you click on this. Uh, mm. uh the qr code scanner will open up and you can pull the link the the url from the qr code as well so in case your uh your server urls are embedded in a qr code and you have made that qr code available to the users they can scan the url from there so they don't need to type the url they can extract it from the qr code itself so that's why that option is there yeah thanks especially when if the, if the if the instance is loaded in the cloud, then sometimes cloud uh, URL is not as simple like a dash exactly. or, yes. yeah. and then you don't have to type it. You just have to scan it and it will be loaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So the steps are pretty simple. Go to Google Play Store, search for DHIS2 capture, and it will show you a single result with the DHIS2 application. Click on install so that the app gets installed on your device. Okay, we have a couple of minutes more. Uh, excuse me, I'm having a small question here. 
Yes, please. Uh, now, uh, guys, a link for us on link.hispindia.org. Mm -hmm. And username I have used it academy and the password stop COVID. Uh, whatever okay. Might be. So uh, for the but Android, it, yeah, for the Android session, we'll give you uh, uh, a specific username and password which you can use. I can just put on the chat. You can use that for login. So if you've already downloaded the application, then I can quickly put in the username and password. The link is same, no? Uh, link, you can use both. You can either use the exercise link or the demo link. Both are same databases. Right. Thank you. Okay. So let's move ahead. I'll quickly add the password. So once I add the password, One minute, guys. Yeah. So once you add your username and password, you'll have a pop up. So basically, DHI is to maintain some app related statistics to uh get issues uh to record information related to error logs so no patient data is transferred but only the error logs if they occur at uh, any time of login process then those logs are shared with the developers so that they can keep a check on what kind of issues are getting uh recorded from the field so you can click on continue and the app will authenticate your user and then move towards uh setting up the application so as you see uh, the message below, syncing your configuration, that means the app is downloading the, the programs, the data sets, which are assigned to you, uh, to a user and, and the specific organization unit. And once the configuration gets downloaded, the app will also start downloading the data, which is already available uh, on the specific organization units to which you have access to. <clears throat> Can you please share the uh, instance URL too? Sure. So you can use either demo or you can use exercise. Both. So my configuration is synced now and the app is syncing the data. Okay, so once your synchronization uh, is complete, you this is the landing page of the app. You will see a list of programs to which you have access to and the number of people who are currently enrolled in the program at the clinics which are assigned to you, to your respective user, okay? Now let's have a look at the, the programs which are available. So you have three programs available. One is your COVID-19 vaccination registry. The second is COVID-19 case-based surveillance. And the third is COVID-19 contact registration and follow-up. Okay. So let's click on the COVID-19 case-based surveillance program. So once you click on the program, you will see the list of individuals who are already enrolled into the program. Okay. So these are the people who are already part of the program. 
at the respective clinics which are assigned to this respective user okay now you can put some filters on this list as well so on the right hand top screen you see a filter icon you can click on that icon and you will see the list of filters which you can put in okay so you can filter by the enrollment dates you can filter by the clinics you can filter by the status of enrollment you can filter by the status of event and you can also filter by if any user any events are assigned to my user specifically okay so for example if you select you want to see the events which are yet not completed are still open then you can click on open and the list will get updated with the events which are yet to be closed so that means there are there is some data which might uh, needs updation therefore these events are yet to be closed so you can filter out your like, open events only so you can put more than one filters to filter an existing list of patients who are already enrolled in one specific program or you can reset the uh, filters by clicking the reset button and it will automatically go back to list of all the patients who are part of this program irrespective of their existing status of enrollment or uh, event okay <clears throat> can we also change the field that should be appeared in this list for example first time i want some uh, registration number or something like yeah that. so that's that's separate so one is your filtering the records second is your search function which i'm coming to now there you can search by individual patient by uh, different attributes so that you can set when you're configuring your program you can define what would be your searchable fields so the searchable fields which you define on the web are automatically shown on the handle as well. So let's do a search of an individual which already exists in the system. So you see a search toolbar available on the top. When you click on that, you'll get the list of searchable items. So you have system generated case ID, you have local case ID, first name, surname, and country of residence. So you can search by these respective cases. So let's try to search by an ID. And okay, so you can put one or multiple fields. Uh, while setting up a program, you can you all define that how many fields you want necessarily to do a search. So here, at least one attribute is defined. So you just need to put it and click on the search icon at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so if the person is not available in the program it will give you that no more results available in the COVID-19 case surveillance program. So you can go back and try to change your search criteria and look for another person, okay? So this time I'll put the, say the first name and the last name. So I'll put Brianna. So we might put as Rachel. So now I have two Brianna Richards, okay? So now this is already available in the device because I have access to this particular uh, organization unit. This particular patient, the second one, is available on the web database. Since I'm connected to the internet right now, so it is doing both offline and uh, both in-device and also searching from the web instance. So in case I need to access this record, I will need to download it first from the web so that I can access this person. But if I am looking for the person who has been registered at my respective organization unit, then I can select the first one. Okay. So once you select, click on the first record, it will open up the record. And you can see all the events which are associated to this respective individual. Okay. So you have four stages in your COVID-19 case surveillance program. Your first stage is clinical examination and diagnosis. The second stage is lab request. The third stage is lab result. And the fourth stage is health outcome. So you can enter data for these four stages for this respective individual by using the Android application. Okay. Now on the bottom of the screen, you have these four tabs. So first one is the details tab which is basically the page on which you are on there by default. And it shows the information of the tag entity instance, the person that you're tracking and the details of the stages or the events, which can be added for this respective individual. Okay. If you click on the second, uh, with the second option, that is your indicators tab, 
where you can see the information related to the person, the age, the total number of tests done. And then you have some charting which automatically happens for the data elements, which are of type number or, uh, or uh, mostly number, uh, where you can see the number of tests done and then you, the, the charting is followed at present. So at present, the uh, app picks up the number fields automatically and plots them uh, on the basis of a timeline. Uh, but in the next upcoming releases, uh, you will be able to define that for which data elements you want to plot a chart. So for example, for this person, the number of tests or um, doesn't really make sense. Uh, but if I was tracking, for example, the sugar levels or weight levels of a certain individual, then I can define that I want to do charting of the sugar levels or the weight over a period of time. So in each visit I come, the app will do a charting of the weight values which I entered or the sugar values which I entered or say the blood pressure values or anything which is, uh, uh, which is more suited to do a charting for that specific person. So right now it automatically picks up the number of items which are there of number type, but in the future releases, you'll have the option to choose that for which data elements you want to create these charts on the indicators tab. Okay. The third tab, which you see on the bottom is relationships. So you can add your relationships here. If your program uh, has uh, been configured with a relationship uh, with another program, then you can do that. So as we know for our COVID case surveillance program, we have a relationship with the uh, case space, uh, with the contact registration and follow-up program. So you can create relationships from here. So within the COVID case surveillance program, you can search for an individual who is registered as a contact in the contact registration and follow-up program and create a relationship between the COVID case and the contacts. Okay. Mm -hmm. The fourth one is the notes section. So if you want to add any notes respectively to this person, then you can add a note here and save that. Okay. So these are the details tab which are there. Now let's go back to the first tab, which was a details tab and review this one. So if I click on see details, I'll see the list of attributes, the registration attributes, which have been filled for this respective person, the local case ID, first name, surname, the date of birth, country of residence, mobile phone number, and all the attributes which I have defined. So if I want to update anything and come back to see details, do the updations and click on the save button to make those changes in the profile. Okay. So if you have done some changes, but you don't want to save them, then you can click on discard changes. But if you want to keep on editing the profile, then you click on keep editing. So right now I've not made any change. So I'll just do, I click on the save button and go back. But if I go back without clicking on the save button, then the app will ask me what to do, either to discard the changes or keep editing the form. If you click on any of the stages which are given here, you will see the list of events which have been already added to this program stage. Now, depending upon the program configuration, uh, you may have uh, one single, uh, say, a non-repeatable stage, or you may have a repeatable stage. So depending upon the type of program stage which you're creating, you can see the number of events which have already been created for this person. So we see that one event for clinical examination and diagnosis has already been added. So I see one in the list. So I click on that event and I can see the details which have been filled for this respective event. Okay. So you'll see the sign-in symptoms, the date of symptom onset, fever, temperature, cough, shortness of breath, and all sections available here. If it's a female patient, you'll see the pregnancy details section. You can see the underlying uh, uh, conditions. If I click it on yes, then you'll see the list of uh, conditions as well. So this works similar to how the web system works. So all the, the program stages, the program stage sections and the program rules of skip logic start to define, which are working in the same way as the web version will also work on the Android app as well, okay? So you can exit the record. So you can click on the save button and the record is saved now and it takes you back to the, uh, the, the home page for that respective patient or the dashboard of that respective patient, okay? So uh, now I, I'll, uh, uh, before moving ahead, uh, we can go to the learner's guide for this session and there is an exercise available as exercise one. So let's take a few minutes of our time and do the exercise one in the learner's guide. So let's take around uh, seven minutes and then we move ahead to uh, the next steps on how to enter data for the, the cases on an Android device. 
Okay. With any questions, please feel free to put on Zoom chat or on Slack. Uh, we'll answer that question at the earliest possible. All right, let's uh, move ahead. So let's try to register a new case. Uh, so the ideal practice which is recommended is that always do a search before you register. So uh, we have already seen the search function. Uh, so let's utilize it once more to check whether we have a person with the same credentials or not. So I go to the search option again. I'll add a name, Jane. Um, select Dawson. So we don't have this person registered in the program already. So you can click on create new, which you see in the bottom of the screen, you have an option to uh, create new. When you click on create new, it will ask you to select the clinic where you want to register this respective individual. Now the selectable boxes would be the units which are assigned to you or the clinics which are assigned to you as part of your user details. So if you have access to more than one clinic, you'll see the option to select more than one, but if you only assign a single clinic, then you'll get only the single option to select. So I'll select one of the clinics and click on accept. Then next, it will ask you the date of registration. So if you're registering the patient today, you can, can select today's date and click on accept. And it will load the registration form for you. So you see, you see the date of registration, that is the case registration date, which is the enrollment date in the program. The enrolling org unit is CHW Mahasot, which I just selected. If you want to select the location of that respective person, then you can click on the coordinates icon. So for the first time, you'll need to give access to the permission to capture the device location. So you select while using the app. So it will automatically pick up the coordinates, the latitude and longitude using the phone's GPS for and associate these coordinates with the new enrollment that you're making. Okay. In case you want to select a polygon, then you can select the polygon option and you can choose the area which you want to associate with this respective person. So you can do both. Either you can do the, the coordinates which are more accurate, the pinpoint location, or you can select a broader polygon for that respective person as well. Once you go to the registration section, you'll see that the details that you filled during the search process are already pre-filled because you were searching the person by a combination of first name and the last name and the record was not found. So the search results or the search parameters which you added are automatically pushed to your registration form so that you don't have to fill them again. Okay. The system generated ID is auto-generated in the system as the name says. So you already have this ID available. You can add the local case ID if it's available with you and you can move ahead with the registration. So you click on the date of birth, you select the year and say the date and click on accept and automatically the age will get calculated because you have defined a program rule that from to calculate the age in years automatically once you have the date of birth added either through the current date or the enrollment date. So you can put the difference there. Then you have different fields available for country of residence. You can select uh, any one of those. You can add the phone number and you can add much more information which you want to store. Okay. So if you have added the minimum information which you have at present, then you can click on the save button and it will take you to the next form, which is your stage one. That is your program stage. In case you want to select the coordinates to be associated to the event as well, you can again click on the, uh, the coordinates icon and click on update and it will open the form for you. Okay. So again, you'll have the same data entry to do. If there are any sign-in symptoms, you select yes. If you select yes, then it will show the, the, the most uh, common symptoms which occur under COVID-19. If you select no, then the, the questions will go away. So the skip logics work in the same manner. You can select the information here, fever. Then if you have fever, then it will ask you your temperature in degree Celsius, you can add that, cuff, yes. And you can add more details. So if you want to report pregnancy details, you can click on the pregnancy details section. Others unknown, underlying conditions. 
no travel history you can just put something here travel yes country one then it will ask you how many countries you visited so i'll just put some random and then you assess that if you're coming from a country which has high prevalence of covid cases right now so that could be one of your uh, country where you might have got exposed so this is based upon a manual assessment of what could be the most uh, likely country of exposure for this respective case okay so once you fill the information you can save this information by clicking on the save button which is given below at the bottom of the screen so once you click on save you get two options so the data is saved now but if you still have some information which is not available right now but you would like to fill it later then you click on not now so it will save that information but the status of event will still remain open because you have not marked it as complete okay but if you have filled all the information that you have and you don't need to keep this form as an open uh, form or an open program stage or an open event then you can click on the complete button okay so when you click on the complete button you will see you will see a green icon against it in this one so that means that all the information which is available has already been entered and the event is marked as complete if this would have been still open you would not see the green icon here you will see a different icon okay So now you have your uh, second exercise in your learner's guide. So let's take a few minutes to do the second exercise before we go on to uh, the next, next step. If any questions, please, please feel free to put on chat. Uh, we'll answer them uh, parallelly. Okay. Uh, Let's move ahead. So in the next part, what we'll see is uh, how we can uh, add a new event to an existing uh, record. So we saw that uh, when we enrolled this respective person, the first stage was automatically selected for us. So when you are configuring your tracker program, you can define whether you want the first stage to open immediately after enrollment. So as soon as you add a person in the Android application, it will automatically guide you through the first program stage, which was clinical examination diagnosis in this case. And the rest of the events you can add as and when information is available. So for example, you added this respective person and now you want to carry out a, a, a lab investigation for this person to confirm the diagnosis for COVID-19. So you see a plus button against each of these stages. So you can click on the plus button and you will see two options, add new and referral, okay? So as we saw in the web application, you can also do a referral using the Android application. But here we just want to add a new event right now. So we click on add new. And it will automatically take up the today's date as default and the org unit which you had selected during enrollment as default. Okay. You can click on next. <clears throat> so it will create the event for you. And then it will ask the question which are part of that respective event. Uh, why you're testing for COVID-19. So let's say contact of a case, the specimen details, the type of specimen which are defined. So for example, let's say nasopharyngeal aspirate. When did the sample got collected? Say today. And the sample was sent to laboratory today. Okay. And type of test, let's put PCR. Okay, and just save it. Again, we have filled all the information. So we we'll click on complete, okay. Now, if we want to report the uh, the lab result, for example, it is available now. So again, you do follow the same steps. You click on the add new button and you uh, add data for a specific uh, event. Now, in the program design, you will see the lab request and the lab result stages are repeatable. So you can create multiple events for, uh, for each program stage, which are repeatable in nature. So if you go back to lab request, you'll see the plus button is still there. So you can add one more lab result, lab request, or you can add multiple results for your multiple requests which have raised. But if you go to the stage one, once this event is added, you see there's no plus button here. That means that this program stage is of non-repeatable nature. You cannot create this event more than once. Okay. So this can only be created once for each patient. But 
if you see for lab request and lab results, you see that the plus button would always be available because these are repeatable. So you can create multiple lab requests. And against the lab requests which you have raised, you can create corresponding lab results also. Okay. So I go to lab results quickly, click on add new. You can select the coordinates again, click on next. And say the test was done today. The type of specimen was uh, nasopharyngeal aspirate. The type of test was PCR, and the test result was positive. And you can select complete. Okay. So you added the lab request in the lab result, which happened today. Now, 10 days later, if I want to do an exit test for the same patient, then I can again come back to lab request and add a new event 10 days later and uh, <clears throat> and add the same information that I want to do a repeat test and the result can be added again. So you can, so for repeatable stages, you can add the event uh, multiple times, okay? Okay, so let's take a few minutes. There is again exercise three in the learner's guide, which is basically on adding events. So you can add a couple of events for both repeatable and non-repeatable program stages and then see the difference. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> let's move ahead. Now we saw that we can add data for repeatable uh, program stages multiple times depending upon the need. Uh, then the last event which is available is for health outcome. Now again, the outcome will be added only once. So you can click on the plus button, click on add new, click on next and add the outcome that the person recovered. And if he was hospitalized, then on what date was he hospitalized? And contact somebody, how, to, how, how many contacts are followed up for this case? For example, let's add one and click on save and complete. So now you have added all the events which could be relatively added for this respective program. So when you're configuring your program, you can define that uh, if you have completed your health outcome, whether you would like to uh, complete the enrollment as well. So this is an optional setting which is there. For this program, it is uh, uh, configured, so you can do that. But let's not do it right now. Let's click on cancel. We don't want to... Uh, complete the enrollment right now. Uh, let's add a relationship for this respective person. Okay, so now this is a confirmed COVID-19 case and you want to add contacts for this respective case. So from the bottom of the screen, you see you go to relationships icon. That's the third icon in the sequence. You click on that. You see that there are no relationships at present. Click on the plus button and select the relationship. So for COVID-19, case surveillance and COVID-19 contact registration follow-up, there's a relationship which is known as has been in contact with. You select that. And <clears throat> from the top bar, select the program through which you want to create this relationship. So go on top, select COVID-19 contact registration and follow-up. So it will give you the list of individuals who are already part of the COVID-19 contact registration program. Uh, from what is available in your device, okay? So you can search for either the person who is available in the device or you can also do an online search if you're connected to the internet right now, okay? So let's try to search for a person. So I click on the search button and I'll put in the first name and the last name, say John. Uh, and I click on search. So I'll see that this person is already available. So I can select on this person and you'll see that you'll see a relationship added already that this person has been in contact with, with the person that we just registered and the new person that we registered. Okay. So likewise, if there are multiple contacts, you can keep on adding relationships one by one. Okay. So if there are five contacts who were registered or contacted for this index case, then you can add five people. So you'll see the list of those five people available here who are in contact with their respective case. If you click on the record of that person, you'll see the record uh, of that person and you can further go and have a look at the records and what details have been collected for this respective person as well. Okay. 
now I have done all the steps. I had added the uh, in the I have registered that respective person. I have added data for events, and it required for me to create relationships. So I did that as well. So um, let's look at completing the enrollment. Yeah. So now you can click on the the ellipsis you see here on the uh, on the rightmost corner of the screen on the top corner. And you see there's a complete button given here. Okay. If you click on the complete button, it will change the status of enrollment to completed. Earlier it was open. Now it is uh, marked as completed. So one instance of a COVID-19 infection for this case, all the data has been entered. The relationships have been made. So this instance can be closed now. If the same person gets COVID-19 again, so you can create a new enrollment of the person for the same target instance. So you can create that. So these enrollments can be created in such programs where you have multiple instances of the same condition. Okay. For example, if you're tracking a pregnant woman, uh, then each pregnancy could be a new enrollment within the same program. So you can do pregnancy one as one enrollment. Once you have the outcome available for pregnancy one, you can close that enrollment. In the next pregnancy cycle, if the patient comes into the clinic, you can search for that person and re-enroll that person in the program and track the pregnancy again from the start. So you can do that in different use cases where you have you you observe that you can have multiple instances of the same condition for a one particular uh, person across the program that we've created. <clears throat> okay, so now we have added relationships. We have completed the program. So there is exercise four available in your learner's guide. Let's do that exercise first before we move ahead uh, to enrolling the same person into other programs. Okay. So let's take a few minutes or let's take four minutes and then we can uh, resume with the next, uh, next topic. Excuse me, I have a small problem. Uh, it's about this page for health outcome. Uh, uh, there is an option for follow up, so uh, but it's not uh, uh, open for future dates. Uh, can you explain more about this page for health outcome? Okay, so based on your uh, uh, program design you can um, you can schedule events if your uh, if your uh, workflow allows for that so for example if you have done the lab result uh, you've got the lab result today and you want a health outcome to be scheduled say 15 days later when you want to retest the patient with an exit test and put health outcome then you can schedule a uh, event for health outcome or you can so you can define that at what intervals you want this scheduling to happen okay so right now since uh, i did all the data entry for say today's date but if you look at the sequence at which the person will get registered so you will start with today's date as the enrollment date if the person was uh, came as a suspected patient today and then you got the lab test done uh, and then the results came say two days later so based on that sequence, you can continue to add data. So health outcome basically will happen, say, 15 days after the date of enrollment into the system. So right now, since uh, you, we are adding new events, so we don't see the uh, future date. But if you're scheduling events, then you can see the future dates as well. Okay. So you can, while configuring your program, you can define that what programs you want to uh, schedule and what stages you want to schedule and what stages you don't want to schedule. So if there is a, um, a requirement to have a schedulable stage, then you can define that. And then you can schedule the stage and put a future date as well for that respective event. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
okay uh, let's move ahead then <clears throat> so now we've seen that we've added or registered a person into one program and the, the premise of using tracker is that you can re-enroll or you can enroll the person into different programs uh, by registering that person once okay so for example here uh, in this scenario you suppose i was um i was part of the covid 19 uh, case surveillance program so i i had contacted covid and now i'm already registered into the system and now the same database or the same system is also being used for covid 19 vaccination there is no need for me to get in registered again into the system i can just be searched based on my say national id or my name or mobile number and then i can be enrolled into a new program altogether so for doing that, I click on the ellipses icon, which you see on the top, in the top corner, you click on that and you see the option for program enrollment. Okay. So this will show you the programs in which you're already enrolled and the programs in which you can be enrolled at present. Okay. So these are all the programs which are there in the, uh, in assigned to your user. So you're already part of the COVID-19 case surveillance program. And you can enroll yourselves into uh, the COVID-19 vaccine registry and the contact registration. Okay. So let's pick the vaccine registry enrollment. Click on enroll. It will again ask the date of registration. Let's select today's date. Click on accept. And the health facility we are getting enrolled for the COVID-19 vaccination program. So I'll select the same health facility and click on accept. <clears throat> so again, you see the enrollment form available here. Now, all the data which I had previously filled in the COVID-19 case surveillance program that has already been pulled in into the new program registration form. Okay, So when I got registered in the COVID case surveillance program, I had entered my first name, last name, date of birth. So all of that has been pulled in already. Now, there are a few fields which are program specific, which are only for the COVID-19 vaccine registry program. Those you can fill to complete the enrollment. So for example, uh, I want to fill my national ID, then you can add more information about national ID, you can add your address details, etc. So these attributes were not collected in the COVID case surveillance program. If they were already collected, then the value will get pushed as it is from the program through which you're enrolling this person into another program. And then you can fill in the remaining values and click on the save button. So now again, the same person is now part of the COVID-19 vaccination registry program, which is enrolled through the COVID-19 case surveillance program. So there are two ways. You can either directly add a person to vaccination registry program, or you can search the person in the COVID case surveillance program and redirect the person into the vaccination registry program. The rest of the workflow remains the same. So now I'm also part of the COVID-19 vaccination registry program. And I can add data for my vaccination details and the same way I was adding events in the case surveillance program. <clears throat> if I go back to my landing page now, so you see that I have COVID-19 case surveillance program list available here, but you'll see the vaccination program icon also. So that shows that I am part of two programs now. I'm part of the COVID case surveillance program and I'm also part of the vaccination registry program. If you go to the vaccine registry program, you will see the icon of the people who are coming from the vaccine registry program. So you see this icon here. Okay. So this way you can see that this person is part of, is enrolled into multiple programs, uh, either case surveillance only or case surveillance plus vaccination. Okay. So you can see how in how many programs the person is already enrolled. Or you can go to the patient dashboard again, go to the ellipsis icon, click on program enrollments you will see both the programs in which the person is enrolled okay so you can see either from here or you can see from the list as well through the icons which are there on the device <clears throat> so this is how you can enroll one person into multiple programs so now you have an exercise five in the learner's guide which is on enrolling the existing beneficiary into another program so let's quickly do that uh, we'll take say a couple of minutes let's say three minutes uh, to just select a beneficiary choose the program enroll and then we can move ahead with the next step
All right. Now we've seen how you can collect data using uh, the Android device. Now this data could be collected online or offline, both in the absence or presence of internet. But then we need to ensure that whatever data we have collected is getting pushed to the web server. Uh, so to ensure that we have completed the reporting of data from the device to the, the web server. So you see some signs available on next to the programs, which are these gray color arrow icons. That means data is still available locally on your device. So you need to sync the data to the, the uh, web server. So syncing are of two types. One is manual, then other one is uh, based on a scheduler. So you can go to the settings button, click on this ellipsis next to the home uh, icon, go to settings, <clears throat> click on sync data okay so by default the frequency is set to one day so from your login to next 24 hours the app will automatically sync the data or will try to push the data uh, through uh, a scheduler so if at the gap of 24 hours from your last login you have internet connection available so it will attempt a synchronization and push all the information available locally on the app to your to the web server okay so you can define different frequencies, 30 minutes, 1 hour, 6 hours, 12 hours. The user, if the, the way the configuration has been done and the app has been set up, if a user can select these frequencies on their own, then you can select. But you have applications available such as the Android settings app where you can define global settings for all the users across the implementation. So if you set 30 minutes as your default uh, uh, sync time, a sync duration or sync interval, then after every 30 minutes, the app will try to synchronize the data with the web server. But there's also a manual option given at the end. So if you select manual and click on sync data now, the app will start pushing the data based on the trigger that we've given. Okay. <clears throat> so once the sync is done, you can go back to the home page and you'll see those arrows have gone away. That means the data which is available locally on the device uh, is now part of the web server okay so you can go and look for uh, cases on the web which you have already added which you had added on the android device but now they are synchronized with the with the web version so you can do a search uh, as well okay so uh, let's take one example and search for that person okay so let me reshare my screen let's go to the web version now <clears throat> okay so I had added a person with the national local case ID as 7577. The name was Jane uh, and the surname was Dawson on my Android device. So let's search for that person. So now this person was added on the Android device. And when I did a sync, this record was pushed to the web server. So since I had completed the enrollment, you see that the enrollment is complete. I can add a new enrollment for this person if this person again contacts COVID-19. But if I want to see the data which I entered in this complete enrollment, I can click on this and have a look at the data which I had added <clears throat> in the stages in the mobile application. I also enrolled the same person in the vaccine registry program. So you see that this person is also part of the vaccination registry program. You can go and look at the details in the vaccine registry program as well. Okay. So this way you can enter data on the Android application and synchronize it later with the web version, with the web server, and the data will get pushed automatically to the uh, to the web server. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So now you have exercise six in the learner's guide where you need to synchronize your data, which you have collected locally. So those who have been able to log in and have entered some data, please uh, do a sync uh, with the web server. And then you can check the information that you've added, whether it's available on the web 
uh, server or not. I see there are some cases which are already added, which are getting synchronized uh, as we are moving ahead. Uh, so you can do the same and check for the records that have been added on the web instance. Okay, so a uh, few details more that I need to share, then we can start wrapping up the session. <clears throat> so if you go to the settings, you have the sync parameters. Now, uh, of course the Android app cannot have or cannot store infinite amount of data because that is dependent on the phone's capacity, the, the the storage capacity available on the device. Therefore, you can define to a limit that how what how many records can be downloaded on a specific device. So you can limit the number of people and the number of events which can be downloaded in the device when you log in for the first time or the app does synchronization. So if you can, when you're using your in your implementations, we're using Android settings app, that's a web app where you can define the global properties for the Android implementation across your uh, devices. There you can set that at a maximum, the app can download the data for 500 most updated tracked identity instances in your device and 1000 most updated events, okay? So you, you can go up to 2000, where you can say 2000 people and 2000 events. The reason being that you have to look at the device's capacity to hold that data. So therefore you can, put global settings that this is the minimum or maximum amount of patient data you want to download in each device. So <clears throat> the most updated records or the most recent records out of your entire database will be part of your app by default. But if you're connected to internet, then you can always do online search and pull data for records which are not part of your device, but still they can be pulled in by doing an online, online search. Okay. Then you have these, in all the programs, you have these auto-generated IDs that we saw. If I was adding a new person in the COVID case surveillance program, an ID was getting automatically generated. Now, these IDs can be generated both uh, online as well as offline. So let's look for a person, <clears throat> create a new record. So you'll see that this ID got generated. Now these IDs will get generated both online and offline because when you had done a sync or you had uh, logged in for the first time or you had synchronized your data and your metadata, at that point of time, a reserved number of IDs were pushed to your device. So for example, 100 automatically generated IDs from the web instance were pushed to your device so that when you're doing offline data collection, then you can utilize the IDs which are available in your device by default. So this way, these reserved IDs become part of your Android application offline, and then you can use these IDs uh, for your data uh, collection when you're offline as well. So if you're online, then automatically, if you uh, if you uh, if your existing IDs get all used up, then you can immediately download a new set of IDs from the web instance. Or if you're offline, then it will use the reserved IDs, which are uh, filled every time you do a sync. So new IDs are pushed. So at a maximum, you can have 200 reserved values. So these 200 IDs become part of your reserved IDs, and then they can be used for offline data collection. So if your implementation has been configured, the program has been configured in a way that it needs to auto-generate these IDs, then the app has uh, the provision to keep reserved IDs available in each device so that if you're offline and you need this automatic ID to be generated, then it can pick up the values from the reserved values which are available in the IDs, okay? <clears throat> so just to correct myself, you can keep 
uh, up to 500 IDs reserved values in the anode application, which is the, the highest recommended uh, figure. Okay. All right. So last part is your exercise seven, which you can try um, uh, from the learner's guide. So you can, you can uh, quickly do that. Uh, I couldn't go make the app offline because if I do it offline, then my uh, casting goes away. So, but you can try, you can put your, uh, you can uh, put your mobile data or your Wi-Fi off and get uh, uh, with no internet connection, you, you can also enter records offline. So you can try that because if I do that, then my screen sharing goes away. So you can put your uh, phone to without Wi-Fi and without mobile data, and you can continue doing uh, uh, data entry. And then you can try the uh, offline use case as well as mentioned in the uh, learning slide. So you can do that as well. <clears throat> so let's take a couple of minutes, then we can quickly do the a wrap up or the recap of the Android session. And then we can just quickly wrap up for the day. Uh, we are around eight minutes behind schedule. So we can quickly wrap this up. Can I have a quick question? Sorry, sort of I'm taking you. No problem. Yeah, Subair, please go ahead. Uh, okay, let's suppose uh, you configure this limit to 100 and 100 reserved IDs will be available. <clears throat> and there are two Android devices, for example, in the field collecting case. So these two Android devices <clears throat> will have their own set of 100 pre-generated reserve IDs, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Second, second thing is uh, once you are in the process of uh, creating uh, patients using these reserved IDs in an offline mode, and then uh, system on the back end, which I presume is responsible for taking care if there are some entries being made using web app with the internet connectivity, then uh, system has to make sure that it should not use one of the IDs from the reserved values. Otherwise, if a system, if the person is enrolling entity on the desktop system with online connectivity, <clears throat> If he gets the same ID, then synchronization will be a problem. I assume this is being handled in the back end. Yeah, the assumption is correct that when you are reserving these IDs for offline use, then all the IDs which are reserved uh, are not attributed to any online record. So they're only reserved for offline data collection. So this is taken care of, or else you'll have duplicates uh, amongst the identifiers, which is not a, a good practice to have. So yeah. that is already taken care of at the back end. Yes. Perfect. Thanks. There is a question. I think, yes, we can do that using enrollment status. Yeah. So in the working lists, which you have in your program, you can filter the work list, the working list by closed enrollments, active enrollments, and with any status. So I think that was, I think Gitika showed it. Maybe I can show that again. So here you see you have this working list. You are now you have any enrollment status. You have only those with active enrollment, those with complete enrollment, those with canceled enrollment. So from here you can list. Uh, uh, you can <clears throat> do a filtered list of uh, by enrollment status. So you can do it on the web version. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's quickly do the recap of the session then. So yeah, what we learned in the session that we can use the Android Capture app to search and register individuals in event and tracker programs. Uh, the widgets which you saw on the tracker capture web application are available as tabs in the Android app, the relationship indicators details. So now that those are available at the bottom of the screen. Uh, during data entry, you can collapse 
and expand the section. So all the program state sections are expandable and collapsible depending upon the workflow. Uh, you can add repeated events, relationships, and enroll the person in multiple programs, similar to what you do on the web application. And the advantage of using the Android application is that you can collect it offline, which is uh, not the functionality available in the web version. For the web version of Tracker Capture app, you always need to have constant supply of internet to ensure that you are able to enter data. But in Android application, you can collect data offline as well and later synchronize it with the, with the web server. Okay. So this was a summary of the Android Capture app. Um, now you have two graded assignments for today, one for the tracker capture web and one for the tracker, the DHS to capture the Android application. Um, so after this today's session, we request you to go to Moodle and complete your graded assignments because these will get, uh, uh, these will contribute towards your overall grades uh, for your certificate generation. So uh, you, have a deadline which is mentioned on Moodle till what date you need to complete your graded assignment. So please ensure that you finish your graded assignments within the stipulated timeline so that it can be factored in while generating your respective certificates. If there are any questions, then uh, please let us know. You can just check the chat. Okay. Uh, yes, Jogel, you can please unmute and ask a question. Uh now, I was uh, wondering if uh, we can uh, differentiate between the completed enrollment and active enrollment in report. And the one which uh, Gitika had shown earlier, <clears throat> it was just based on uh, the demographic data. And uh, if we have to uh, differentiate the completed and active enrollment uh, da uh, data within the program stage stages, then uh, how, how do we uh, do this? Okay. So one is the working list, which you can see using the tracker capture web apps, as I showed. So that is one way of filtering out your case-based data. Uh, or else in terms of the analytics, I think in program indicators, when you conflict with those, there have been some new variables which have been introduced, uh, which are, I think the program status and the program state status or the enrollment status to be uh, sure I can just check. So there you can define if you want to count the number of uh, enrollments which are completed, then you can define your program indicator and put the uh, filter as enrollment status. I can double check that and I can confirm that it works in the same manner. But but the the support has been introduced in in new versions of DHS to to <clears throat> have. You just give me a second. I can quickly check and answer that question. Yeah, so you have a variable called enrollment status. Uh, there you can put the enrollment status as active, completed, or cancelled, and then you can count for that respective program how many enrollments are active, cancelled, and uh, completed in for that specific period. So you can do that via program indicators. I hope that answers your question. Uh, uh, is this for uh, only the later version of the DHS2 or <clears throat> it works for the older ones as well? I can check. Uh, I rem If I remember correctly, it was from version 2.35 or 3.6 onwards, but I can check uh, to what versions was it backported. So I can check and I can come back to you tomorrow. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so we are 15 minutes behind schedule. So apologies for that. If there are any more questions, uh, we request you to put those questions on the Slack channel for questions. If in the graded exercises, if you face any challenges, then please feel free to put a question on Slack. We'll respond to it at the earliest possible. And uh, we have covered the, the first two sessions that we wanted to do uh, on the first day of the, the, the normal course. Um, and thank you everyone for your patient listening and your time. 
and we look forward to active participation in tomorrow's session as well. The Zoom link will remain same. You can access the Zoom links on your Moodle accounts. You can do that. A copy of the link is already available on the, uh, the announcements channel on Slack. So you can join in from there as well. So the timings will remain same and we look forward to having you tomorrow as well. Thank you, everyone. And please feel free to write any question comments directly to the facilitators or you can put in the questions channel as well. So look forward to meeting you tomorrow as well. Have a good day ahead. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.